Good evening. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is Craig Trulia, and I'm very happy today to do the Book of Romans. It's a tough subject to take on a book of the Bible with so much controversy, and you need to get your bacon and egg sandwich ready so you could have the energy to pay attention. So that being said, we're doing the Book of Romans. We'll be covering some historical context when we do it, and then we will exegete the book. My central thesis is the book explains itself, and the popular Protestant and Roman Catholic and Pop Orthodox apologetics you hear on the book are not terribly accurate and don't do justice to the Orthodox Doctrine of Justification, which I've written in quite a bit of detail on, I think 12,000 words in my blog, but we're not covering that tonight. Another thing we're not covering specifically is not every facet of justification, but we're also not covering all the fathers on the Book of Romans. This is the uh, ancient Christian commentary on the Book of Romans. It's sort of like a very large uh, catena uh, that like, uh, Thomas Aquinas made. And if you look closely to it, I don't know. I've read this thing and made a bunch of notes. Doesn't prove I understand a word of it, right? Doesn't really prove anything. But what's my point? We could have another show where we talk about the fathers in detail, but that won't be this show. This show is just unpacking the book. We wouldn't have the time to go over a book this thick to go over Ambrosiaster and his very peculiar teaching on justification. We just would not have the time to unpack all that tonight. So that will um, wait till the future. Uh, but what we will do today is teach the book of Romans from an Orthodox perspective. And as we unpack the book of Romans, my hope is that what we will see is the teaching of the father. So when you see the teaching of the fathers to make sense, and I've done my job. If you read this book and it's different, then you will look at the book differently. You won't look at it the same anymore. So let's hope that I can accomplish that. So one thing that's going to help us understand the book of Romans is the historical context. And I love history. And we have to use the very few extant sources we have that are contemporary with the book of Romans because we understand historical context, it's not going to give us a perfect understanding of theology of the Book of Romans because the historical context is too scanty. But I think at least it will help a little bit. So, right, it's not bad if something helps a little bit. And so let's talk about some of the details that may be relevant to the historical context of the Book of Romans. Now, first things first, what is the church of Rome that St. Paul is writing to? Well, it's not his church. We know that. He's not the bishop of Rome, uh, at least not at this time. He traditionally is understood as one of the founders of the church of Rome. When we look at apostolic succession list, uh, early popes will cite that they're the bishop of Peter and Paul. In fact, there's a lot of Orthodox churches today named St. Peter and Paul, and uh, especially along I-90 in New York. It's St. Peter and Paul every one hour you drive an I-90. So it's a very common name of a church. It's a very common lineage for Church of Rome. But at this time, at the penning of the Book of Romans, we know that St. Paul isn't in Rome because he's writing to them to get to Rome. So that's an important detail. Another thing that's important is we have indication that Rome was once a very Jewish church, and then it became a reconstituted church, meaning it made new converts, it got new people, got some old people back, and it appears it became more Gentile-oriented. Now, again, appears. We don't have smoking gun proof, the historical context of the Church of Rome, but we do have the following. We know from Acts chapter 2 that there were Jews from the whole known world that heard the preaching of the gospel of St. Peter and the other apostles, Clearly, that it uh, include Jews from the Church of Rome. We also have this. We have from a secular source, Suetonius writes, as the Jews are making constant disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, 
he, that's the Roman emperor, expelled them from Rome. All right, so we know over some argument over Crestus, Jews were all kicked out of Rome. Well, you might go, well, that's not about Jesus. Well, the same detail is found in Acts chapter 18. So it shows that Acts chapter 18 is likely a first century source, and it corresponds with a first or early second century source. I can't remember exactly when Suetonius wrote. But that being said, in Acts chapter 18 too, it says, in talking about Paul, he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Prisca, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. All right? So we know that all these Jewish Christians were kicked out from Rome, because we see this from Acts 18. But we also know that Jews themselves were kicked out from Rome. The Romans are probably not that discriminating. They view them all the same. So... This seems to be evidence that Rome was a reconstituted church because by the time the Book of Romans is written, we find they're back in Rome. So look at this. Where on earth is Carmen San Diego? I mean, Priscilla and Aquila, right? In Romans 16, 3 to 5, it says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Did they open a new house church in Rome? It sounds like it, saying to the Romans to greet them. So this is an interesting detail. They We know from Acts chapter 18, they were kicked out of Rome. By the time this is written, they're back in Rome. So we know in Acts chapter 20, St. Paul's making his way back to Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 21, he's actually there. So what's relevant about this is that it shows that Prisca and Aquila made their way back to Rome before the events of Acts chapter 20, right? So this, this epistle was written between the period of time that elapsed between Acts chapter 18 to Acts chapter 20, right? So we already know that. Now, we know from Acts chapter 18 that Priscilla and Aquila made their way to Corinth. We also know, according to 1 Corinthians 16, 19, that they were in Asia somewhere, so uh, like some sort of Greek church, like in Ephesus or somewhere to that event. We have some indication that they were perhaps in Ephesus or likely back in Ephesus because this would have been after they were in Rome in Romans 16 and 2 Timothy 4.19. So they move around. Chances are they had money and they probably owned villas in all these different cities and they used their wealth in order to patronize the church and have churches in their homes because it's uh, Priscilla is named first and maybe because she's the one who had the money and Aquila married into it. We could only speculate, but it gives us a window of time of when this book was written. It also gives an indication that when they were kicked out of Rome, all the Jews were. So this was probably more of a Jewish church which is consistent with the fact that Jews were converted in Acts chapter 2, two on the day of Pentecost. So definitely some interesting stuff. Let's continue. So Paul's writing a letter, and St. Paul's not doing it for the fun of it. St. Paul wants money, and we know this from Romans 15. He says, Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way. There by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe that my sincere my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. <clears throat> and that's Romans 15, 23, 24, and 30 to 31. So we know he wants money. It gives us an indication they want to know what he's going to teach, right? It's like when a traveling missionary comes to the church, they usually tell you what they're doing back at their missionary work. Like when uh, Father Paisi uh, did a couple interviews, he's the, the parish priest in Cambodia and Phnom Penh, did a couple interviews on this channel. He generally tells you what's going on in Phnom Penh because it may encourage you to donate money to help spread the gospel in Phnom Penh, right? So you kind of want to know also what they're about, what they're teaching, especially if there's debates. And we can already see in Romans 15, he says that uh, he hopes that I, uh, what do they call it, may be delivered from those of Judea who do not believe. So he's got problems with Jews. And 
that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, which means it's not a given, right? So he's putting the best possible spin on the gospel and how he's teaching it because he's looking for the support of the Roman church. And St. Paul is understood at this time to be a controversial figure. And this isn't me being, I don't know, too much of a liberal. I'm somewhat of a textual critic. Obviously, that's what we're doing right now. But it's not that I'm being a liberal. We see this in Acts chapter 21 with how St. James talks to St. Paul. So, and we see this elsewhere. So I'm just going to make the words bigger for myself so I could read what's going on. And it says in Acts uh, Galatians 2, 11 to 12, St. Paul writes, I withstood him, that's Peter, St. Peter, to his face because he was to be blamed. For certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were the circumcision. So we could infer from Galatians 2 that James was thought to be connected with this Judaizing sect in uh, Jerusalem. And that St. Peter was shamed by them to change some of the customs in which he was living according to when he was with the, uh, the church in Antioch. Now, we see a little more from this, about this in Acts chapter 15. We see this in verse 24. We have heard, and this is the church of Jerusalem writing, that some who went out from us, meaning right people from James, like we see in Galatians 2, some who went out from us, have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. So this is important. Why? Because when Galatians 2 is written, this is obviously before Acts 15. We already agreed. Romans is written between Acts 18 to 20, 21. So we already have some indication that all this, some time passed. But we already know before Romans was written, those of James have already disowned the Judaizers. Because we read that in Acts chapter 15, presuming St. Luke is not using anachronisms and kind of fluffing over stuff to make things look less divisive than they were. But presuming upon the chronology that we have in the extant sources that exist, we see, well, James disowned the Judaizers, but apparently there was still some sort of friction. Hence, St. Paul saying, I hope this is acceptable to the saints, because perhaps this compromise that we see in Acts chapter 15 was maybe more of a, of a compromise than St. Paul wanted to make. Maybe he wanted to have even less of a compromise when it came to meat sacrifice to idols and things to that effect. To those who pay attention, in 1 Corinthians and Romans, St. Paul's reasonings about the eating of, uh, of certain foods that aren't kosher seem to be a little different than the actual counsel in Acts chapter 15, probably because he was even le he was on the far side against the Judaizers, while the actual counsel seems to have struck some sort of compromise closer to St. Paul, but not all the way. Now, that being said, in Acts chapter 21, 18 to 25, we see that there's a reconciliation with St. Paul. And we know this is because they say to him that concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written inside that they should observe no such thing except that they should be keep themselves from things off the idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual morality. So, right, they take this stance from Acts chapter 15, but they told St. Paul, if you read Acts chapter 21, 18 to 25, they say, well, show it's not true that you're teaching against the law, right? So they want Paul to take a somewhat more... Jewish public appearance than he was otherwise doing so beforehand, especially in front of the Jews in Jerusalem. We know from Hegesippus that St. James was in good with the high priest. He was killed at the temple. So why is this relevant? Because there's members of the Sanhedrin, perhaps St. Paul was even a member of Sanhedrin, but certainly Gamaliel, who the Orthodox Church observes as a saint, we believe became a Christian, um, we know Nicodemus was Sanhedrin. We know that uh, Joseph Arimathea, I believe we have evidence he's Sanhedrin. So the point is, the most important, amongst the most important Jews in Jerusalem were Christians. 
we know that the bishop of the Church of Jerusalem, St. James, had firsthand relations with the high priest and served in the temple in some capacity. And why is this relevant? There was obviously some sort of attempt to keep Christianity within the realm of Judaism, which St. Paul obviously was not too concerned about, and to make compromises or a live-let-live live sort of policy. And this is relevant because when St. Paul comes to Jerusalem, he's got to play by St. James' rules. Don't rock the boat. That was St. James' policy. He died by that policy ultimately. He kept the policy until they demanded him to apostatize, which he wouldn't, and then he was martyred. That's a tradition. But that tradition was recorded in the early 2nd century from Hegesippus. So it's extremely reliable by ancient historical standards. But this is relevant for us because it gives us this idea of where St. Paul is, right? He's anti-Judaizer. He's to the right of St. James, where he doesn't really want a compromising stance with the Judaizers. So this makes him, to a large extent, what's that word? Compromise, uh, not compromise. It makes St. Paul, to a large extent, controversial, rather. But he's also doing great things for the gospel. He's recognized for this. He's raising a lot of money for the churches. And so he needs the help of the Church of Rome. And he believes that they will see things his way if he phrases it very carefully. We know that in Romans 16, I think his name is Tertius. He uses a special scribe even to write this letter. He doesn't want to leave anything to chance. Now, I don't, what I don't believe is St. Paul's in any way disingenuous in writing Romans. We wouldn't remember the book of Romans, such a great book, if this were the case. It's very similar to the book of Galatians, just longer, more careful, to he's writing the people that are not his familiars, so he's more respectful to the Romans than he is to the Galatians. And this is largely because he wants their money, and also he's trying to present himself the best positive light because he's controversial. While unlike the Galatians, he's our bishop, he could kind of just lay down the law. He sees the same thing that the Corinthians, Second Corinthians, says, Do you want me to discipline you? Examine yourselves whether you're in the faith, and so. He could be a little more straightforward in those epistles, while in Romans, he's more conscientious and theological. And God has superintended this because it's made the book of Romans such an incredible book. That's why you're watching today. So now, the summary of the actual book is in Romans 1. Right? A, good, a good writer and a good speech maker tells someone what the whole point of the speech or the whole point of the book, whole point of the sermon is right off the bat, and then they unpack it. And so St. Paul follows that very standard literary convention, that very uh, standard present method of presentation. So in Romans 1, 15 to 17, St. Paul says, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek, for in, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So if you want to know what the, what the actual summary of the book is, here it is. Salvation's for the Jews and the Greeks. So right, it's, you don't, the Greeks don't have to become Jews. So this is obviously against the Judaizers. And righteousness is not by following the law. We're going to find it's not by doing necessarily good works. We're going to unpack this. Don't freak out just yet. The just shall live by faith. They're saved by faith in Christ, a life in Christ. Now let's talk about this a little bit. How do the just live by faith? People read that and they understand it in a modern Western context post-Protestant Reformation. We're, they don't live because they had faith at, one, at some time. They don't live because they continue to have some sort of intellectual idea in their mind. They live by faith. The teaching of St. Paul is in plain sight. So what St. Paul is quoting is Habakkuk 2, 4-5. Right? So let's read what the holy prophet Habakkuk is teaching. 
And we're going to realize that this is not like a forensic justification live by faith he's talking about. He's saying this, behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just, right, contrary to the proud, shall live by his faith. Indeed, because he transgresses uh, by wine, he's a proud man, and he does not stay at home because he enlarges desire as hell. And he is like death and cannot be satisfied. Right? So we see the just shall live by faith, contrary to the unjust who live faithlessly. Right? They drink wine. They don't stay at home, meaning they're carousing. He enlarges his desire. He, did the, he, he inflames his passions doing all sorts of wicked things. He's like death and cannot be satisfied, like the people in Romans 1 that do all the immoral stuff we're about to learn about. So... This is so important because, lack of a better way of summing it up, St. Paul is selling you a lifestyle with the gospel, the lifestyle of Christ, not the lifestyle of the law, not the lifestyle of sin. The lifestyle of Christ, the just will live by faith. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about having an idea in your mind. And this is in plain sight because the word live is being used. And when you see it explained by the prophet, that's what's being talked about. Now, we just went over the summary. What we're going to do is now start unpacking it as we go through the book. And that's why you need your egg and bacon sandwich because it's going to take some time. I am not going to solve hundreds of years of debate in one evening. That's for sure. <laughs> but let's continue. Romans 1 to 2. St. Paul, after giving the summary, now starts unpacking who are the faithless people that need salvation. Well, he starts with, in Romans 1, Gentiles with dissolute lives. They're without excuse. They're idolaters. They have all sorts of sexual perversion. They're liars. They are haters of parents. They approve of those who approve of such things. These are just all-around pieces of junk sort of people, human trash. And I, everyone's being the image of God, so no one's really human trash. But St. Paul is purposely presenting them in this light because he's trying to get his audience to say, yeah, they're a piece of crap. I don't like those people, right? I don't like the idolaters. They're without excuse. I don't like the sexual perverts. They're without excuse. I don't like the disrespectful parents. They're without excuse. So, of course, those people need a savior. Now, how are they without excuse? Well, because the law of nature, creation, shows them that they should not be living this way. Now, this is important, and this is where if you read the fathers, you'll find the term law of nature all over the place. It's not in the scriptures. So this is me imposing a paradigm from the fathers onto this book, but I will justify it as such. That St. Paul's of that excuse because what is invisible about God could be seen in, cre in creation, right? That God is just. So what do we see in creation? We see governor governable natural law, gravity, things are predictable. The sun rises and sets in predictable ways. The world is orderly. God is not a God of chaos or confusion, right? He's a, not a God of disorder. He's a God of order. So when we see that there's order in the universe, we become aware we ought to be living our lives orderly. And so because that's the case, people could perceive even without a law of things they can't do, we ought to not be living wickedly. Now, what's important about this is you could convince anyone of this without going to a whole fancy thing. It's the teleological argument of God's existence, natural law, the law of physics, or whatever. Ask someone this. Do you think you're a good person? Of course I am. I'm the greatest person ever. Okay, if that's the case, by whose standards are you good? Oh, well, you know, not, it's not written in stone anywhere, they might say. Have you always followed your own conscience, your own opinion of right and wrong? Well, no. Well, then are you moral by your own standards? Well, I suppose I'm not. That's the point. Our consciences bear witness that we're unjust and that we're wicked and we need a savior. All right. And so this is true in creation. And you could feel in your heart right now, you don't follow your own conscience. So even if you don't agree with all the teachings of the church, or all the teachings of scriptures or all the teachings of anyone, you don't agree with yourself. 
Okay. So we already know we are lawbreakers of the law of nature. This is something that the fathers talk about ad nauseum. We cannot get into more detail tonight. But St. Paul doesn't leave it there, right? It's easy to pick out, well, look at these people living dissolute lives. Let's make fun of those people. He then starts criticizing the law observing Jews, right? Well, you say you follow the law, but you break the law that you say that you follow. So clearly, and it's really because there's so many things in the law, and I think it's Deuteronomy 18.13 that says, you must be blameless before the law your God. No one could follow every facet of the law. It's impossible. Okay? And so it's very easy to prove that Jews aren't justified by the law because they're not following the law. No one can. So people aren't following the law of nature, at least the real dissolute, it appears. And the Jews aren't following the law. Everyone's a lawbreaker. And this is important to understand because I think what we don't perceive is what Christ was coming to correct the Jews wasn't specifically their tithing and their you know actual legal aspects. He said, actually do that stuff. And we have every indication that Jewish Christ Christians continued doing that stuff. That wasn't the main problem. The problem was the Jews literally believed that righteousness came from outside observance, not from a heart that delights in the Lord. The point of the, of the law is to have you live a life regulated by God so you can delight in him. That's the point of all orthodox disciplines today, by the way. But the Jews thought that's not the point. As long as I call the money, uh, I forget what they call it, uh, mammon or something, the money, Corbin. As long as I call the money Corbin, I can do whatever I want to it because I theoretically gave it to the temple. I don't have to take care of my parents. And so they break the law through their made-up laws. But who would seriously do that if they just didn't believe that all that mattered is outside observance? This still exists in Judaism today. You could go to Israel, and on the Sabbath, the elevator will stop automatically each floor so no one could touch the button. I'd speak to Hasidic Jews in Rockland County, New York, and they would, I'd say, well, how do you watch TV on the Sabbath? Well, you just keep it on the channel you want to watch on Saturday. You'll keep it on all night, right? So it's just literally – doesn't matter what the spirit of the law is, clearly to rest in the Lord on the Sabbath. It's just do what you want according to the rules, and you could appease God, like pretty much trick God out, like he's the tax man, and you could get through with tax loopholes. And so the problem with the law is that the law was used as a way to justify oneself. And that's never the point of the law. The point of the law is to point you to God so you can be justified by his righteousness. And that's what it talks about in Philippians chapter 3, that we're justified by the righteousness of God, not by our own righteousness. We participate in the righteousness of God. Now, we're going to get a little more in that, but I want to talk about a little more Romans 2. Now, Romans 2, 12 to 16, some people get sidetracked because there's this sort of passing reference to um, those that their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves the thoughts, accusing or else excusing them. People are thinking there's people without the law who are a law unto themselves. So are they saved by being good? And you'll see the especially moderns will say this is a way for people that have not been reached to be saved by the good works, which is completely contrary to the gospel of what we just explained, that everyone's a lawbreaker. And it's completely contrary to Paul's actual point, right? This passing reference is simply to that, right, we're not saved by outside observances. We're saved by hearts that delight in God, and that becomes a law unto itself, right? That those not having the law become a law unto themselves because they're doing God's will. He's going to argue you do God's will by having faith in Christ. That's his point. But I call this a modern eisegesis because you'll find no saint teach it. No father teaches that Romans 2, 12 to 16 is about somehow the unreached people being saved, their invincible ignorance. It's a modern eisegesis. And they saw the comments here about the law of nature, about people having a conscience and understanding right and wrong, and also being something that ultimately made them where they needed repentance and faith in Christ because they couldn't be justified this way. They would have some merits and they would have some demerits. And that's essentially in Romans 2, 15, what it's talking about. You'll have some good and you'll have some bad. Okay, so Romans 2.12, Romans 2.16 is not about invincible ignorance. The fathers don't teach this. It's not a part of the overall argument. 
But we're talking about the law. In Romans 2 to 3, the point of the law, its usefulness is if you, well, it's only useful if you keep it. So actual law observance is only useful if you actually do it all. But law and law keeping becomes one's circumcision. And so the advantage of what's the advantage of law if only way you can be circumcised, right, spiritually speaking, is by doing all of it and when it's not possible. Well, St. Paul gives the answer. He says that much every advantage is because the Jews have the oracles of God. Also, the law demonstrates man's unrighteousness. It shows we're wicked and need a savior compared to God's righteousness, the one who saves us, right? So the law brings us to God. The law regulates us, right? So the we're going to talk about the point of fasting and orthodox disciplines aren't to do them for their own sake, but they give us hearts that seek God's righteousness and then will allow God's righteousness to indwell us, right? What we're trying to get is the, li the living by faith. And so the law demonstrates man's unrighteousness compared to God's righteousness. So the law is a matter of knowledge. Romans 3.20, the law is the knowledge of sin. We see elsewhere that so we know the law knows we're sinful we're wicked so when people say well why not do evil so good may come so saint paul anticipates well if the law just we can't fulfill it and it just shows us we're wicked and we need a savior well why not just be wicked because then god will do good and saint paul says no that's not the case right because we live by faith we're going to unpack precisely how he actually answers the objection in Romans six but he dismisses it saying that people say this, their condemnation is deserved because we have the law of the knowledge of sin so that we may repent and live by faith, right? So we don't do evil so good may come. We see that we're evil so that we may repent and live by faith. So we have to understand that the law has made it clear that God has committed all the disobedience so he may have mercy on all. So when we see that the law is the knowledge of sin, that we see our wickedness, we see that the unbelieving Gentiles and the supposedly believing Jews that all are unrighteous, then we can realize God has committed all the disobedience, right? And that means we should then repent and live by faith in Christ. Now, it's interesting. Why does Paul build up this crescendo? Remember what I told you beforehand? Well, St. Paul is writing to people that aren't under his discipline. These are the Roman Christians. So you start with people that are the Gentiles that are dissolute and no one likes them. And then you move your way up to the Jews that are law keeping, but you know, they're hypocrites and it's a reconstituted church. So they probably look down upon them too. But then you move up to, like I said, those who have their conscience defending them and accusing them. And you go, wait a second, that's me. And then you move up to what appears to be the Jewish Christians of the church of Rome. And then he say, there's none righteous, right? He's warmed up the Roman audience so they could realize they are part of the group of people that need salvation Christ. Now, of course they would have known this. They've been Christians probably at this point by for two decades, but by speaking in such a way where they could realize, oh, wait, we're on the same page. St. Paul, as a somewhat divisive figure, could say, look, we're on the same side. Please support me, right? So let's talk about that a little bit. Now, if the Roman Christians, some would have maybe justified themselves, we're not idolatrous Gentiles nor nominal Jews. Well, St. Paul says there's none righteous, not even one. Now, some people badly made the argument that, well, this is just St. Paul saying about the Jews. But if you read the psalm, the psalm's about God looking down from heaven, looking on the sons of men, and said, and he says there's none righteous, not even one. And so this is true of all human beings, both Jews and Gentiles. Now, why, why say this? So that every mouth may be stopped, right? You're not righteous, listener, I'm not. And all the world may become guilty before God. Like, oh, no. Right? Is the whole point just to God to make us all crummy? The answer is no. Romans 3.21. But now, it's in the Greek. It's not just something in the translation. The righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. So St. Paul now is starting to give us the solution. Now, I want to say just a, a couple things. One, from the law. 
Modern apologetics tells you that's the Jewish law, but the fathers will say it's the Jewish law and the law of nature. So the righteous of God, apart from our own works of righteousness. Second, notice the righteousness of God is revealed. It's not our righteousness. We disagreed. We can't have righteousness. But now the righteousness of God, it's his righteousness. Okay, so this is something important. Now it gets us into the gospel. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified, being justified, present participle, continuous tense, right? Not past tense. You're, you believed and you were justified. No. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Right? So Christians are being justified, being sanctified. We're being made into God, theosis. But again, that's the Orthodox. We're just talking about now Romans. Being justified through faith. It's a continuous process that demonstrates God's righteousness. We all sin part and fall short of the glory of God, but God is doing something new in us. And we do this by living by faith. All right, now... St. Paul, now that he's given the gospel, he's got the Roman audience hook, line, and sinker. They're paying attention. For all the debates we really have, you really only need to know Romans 4 through 12. The later chapters are more of a topical interest and don't really pertain to the real debates that Roman Catholics and Protestants and Orthodox have. So let me give an overview, and then we'll get into the details, Okay. And so Romans 4 gives examples of being saved through faith. This is very important because when we unpack the examples, we're going to realize they don't follow what the Protestants say they they that house Romans 4 is supposed to talk about. It has nothing about Protestantism when we read Romans 4. So we're going to go over that in just a second. Romans 5 is about living in Christ versus dying in Adam. Right, St. Paul doesn't just talk about original sin just for the fun of it because it was fun to have the, the doctrine. He actually would have been somewhat clearer on the doctrine if that was the point. Rather, he's drawing a dichotomy that there is eternal life through Christ and there was death through Adam. Right, It has to do with living and dying. Romans 6 and 7 are about overcoming objections to what he teaches in Romans uh, 1 to 5, really. And Romans 8 and 12 are recapitulations of the gospel now that those objections have been answered. And in light of the fact that St. Paul has deconstructed that the Jews are going to be saved by just being these nominal law observers, it's going to beg the question and at that time and place, whether that's consistent with God's promises to the Jewish people. St. Paul says it is. That's what Romans 9 11 is about. And we already have a whole stream on Romans 9, so I won't be covering that tonight. You could watch that stream if you want that more detail. <clears throat> tonight, I'm more covering the gospel itself. And uh, we have the following conclusions after we review everything. St. Paul says, for example, in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore, right? I've been told when you see therefore, you have to ask, what is it there for? It's always because it's a conclusion. Having said everything I just said, St. Paul says, now no condem there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Wait a second. If the gospel was, all I have to do is believe, it doesn't matter how I live, then why does he conclude by saying that there's no condemnation for those in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And I'm walking, I'm doing something in the spirit. Yes, you are. We're going to talk about that. Um, now, that doesn't mean you're saved by your works. We're going to talk about that as well. I have other things from saints and also in James chapter 2, uh, other videos we've done on that topic. But we're living by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. We work out our salvation in fear and trembling because it's God who works in us to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is something we're doing because of the grace of God, not something we actually do of ourselves, okay? Now, Romans 12, 1 to 2 gives a very similar recapitulation. 
Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So right, renewing, it's something we're doing. Our living in Christ is our salvation. We're continuously presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. So this is where St. Paul's going. This is what all the fathers take for granted. And this is why when most people read the saints and they on the book of Romans and the book of Galatians, they're like, they're not talking about the stuff I'm used to. It's interesting because they're talking about the stuff St. Paul's actually talking about. What they're not talking about is what everyone's been arguing about the last 500 years because they've been, at that point, 15 centuries removed from St. Paul's writing. And the whole debate was based upon this sort of novel notion of what Romans was talking about, not what everyone believed for 15 centuries before that. So this is important to know the end from the beginning. And let's now go back to Romans 4. And guys, I'm sorry if I'm blowing your minds, but you'll be able to ask questions in the end. Now in Romans 4, it's about salvation through faith, and he gives examples of this. Now, Abraham was saved by faith before any law or doing anything. This is very important because too often apologists, Roman Catholics and Orthodox will say, St. Paul is only writing against, writing against the uh, Mosaic Law. Well, Abraham existed before the Mosaic Law. Mo Moses was several generations after Abraham, and he was saved even before he got uh, circumcised. He was saved before he had his son. So he's saved by faith before doing anything. This is the example we have to work with, but it doesn't end there. That's the mistake people make. They either explain it away as it don't exist or they make it end there. Now, what does St. Paul say? Romans 4, 5. To him who doesn't work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is uncounted for righteousness. So the moment Abraham believed, he was made righteous in God. When you read saints like St. Maximus, they believe he had theosis at that time. All right? And they have then this continuous theosis and these other important events. Now. What I want you to understand is, yes, it was salvific when he first believed, and it continues to be salvific. Faith, salvific character is seen as continuous in the book of Romans. Look at Romans 4.12. Abraham is the father of those who also walk in the steps of faith, which, are Abraham which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. All right, so we're walking in the steps of something we are doing. We're continuing in. Let's continue. Romans 4, 20 to 22. Someone might say, oh, well, that's only about when Abraham believed. It's not, we walk the steps by following only that example, but that's not what St. Paul says in Romans 4 about Abraham. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that he had promised he was also able to perform, i.e. have children years later, and therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. All right? So this is something that's true of Abraham past the point of when he was uncircumcised. And we know this is true, and it's not nice Jesus. Look at James chapter 2. James 2, 21 to 23. Was not Abraham our father vindicated? It's really what the Greek is. By works, when he offered Isaac his son on the altar... Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and was accounted him for righteousness. So it, it's not just before he was circumcised. It's after his circumcision and after he had a son, a second son. A lot of time passed. Why is this relevant? Because we live by faith. We're, the righteous shall live by faith. It's not one and done. It's continuous. It's continuous in the Greek, like we read in Romans 3, those being justified, there's are for now no condemnation for those being justified in Christ Jesus. It's continuous reality. That's literally what the book is saying. So let's take a brief aside then. What do works do? I'm confused. You speak too fast. You're from New York. What do works do? Well, one, if I speak too fast, click rewind. Be kind, rewind. Number two. Here's a, a quick little synopsis from the fathers, and we don't have the time this even to, to break all this out, but works enhance and perfect faith. 
How do we know that? We just saw that by works, faith was made perfect, right? So works are like a faith performance enhancer, all right? Faith, uh, works are evidence of faith, not merely evidence of faith. But we have fathers say, Eva, you know, uh, St. Cyril uh, talks about that when Abraham presented his son Isaac, it demonstrated that he, it made evident that he, he had a very strong faith. So works are evidence of faith. This is something that the saints talk about. Works merit rewards in heaven and punishments in hell. We know this because 2 Corinthians 5.10 uh, says we'll be judged according to the works we do in the body. So works are going to be part of our judgment. They don't earn us salvation. That's the last bullet point. Got ahead of myself. But they do merit additional graces in heaven. And uh, they also merit the withdrawal of grace in the afterlife. But that also accords to this life as well. Right? In Romans 1, you do wickedness, wicked works. God withdraws grace. And those who do good works, God gives the grace to do more good works and to, to believe more profoundly and that's a big part of the Orthodox spiritual life. That's why there's ascetic disciplines. So we have to understand asceticism not as I am earning my salvation, I'm buying my stairway to heaven, I love Led Zeppelin. No, that's not what asceticism is. Asceticism is a faith workout routine, right? You're working out your faith, you're getting more faith, you're getting more grace, you then work out harder, you get more faith, you get more grace, you do more works. So, of course, works are salvific within that context. But it's all outside a context of earning anything because all you're doing is increasingly participating in God's righteousness because that's what makes us righteous. Now, in my article on uh, the articles and justification, the big thing is you need the energy essence distinction to understand why we're saved ultimately. It's not really in the book of Romans, so we're just going to leave it there. But faith, according to Romans 4, is a heart condition. It's not something merely intellectual. So in Romans 4, 5, it says, David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. So someone will quote that and say, well, then, contrary to everything we just said, works have no bearing on salvation, don't have anything to do with it. But does anyone read the actual thing that's being quoted. Well, here's Psalm 32, 2 to 5 in the Masoretic text. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in who in whose spirit there's no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Right? So, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Well, how is he blessed, right, from a righteous part from works? By his repentance, it last day and night. It's a continual confession of transgressions, and through that, God forgives iniquity, right? So it's a condition of the heart. It's the whole point of his contrition. It's not just intellectual. Now, to be fair, I'm going to have Protestants tell me, well, I agree with you. It's not just intellectual. Everything's saying you're right. Then become orthodox. What can I tell you? But the point is, it's not a merely forensic justification, and I could quote reformers teaching it as such, particularly Turretin. Okay? Now let's go to Romans 5. It talks about Christ versus Adam. Now Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have faith, peace with God. <clears throat> we also have this idea of being justified in Romans 5.8-9. While we're yet sinners, and this is the King James, Christ died for us much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved through faith in him. The word now is not in the Greek. <clears throat> the word there is the word justified in the aorist tense. Now, this is confusing. It's confusing because Greek does not have a past tense. Aorist tense could mean past tense, and it could also mean something that's still happening until its point of completion. Now, being that we're not in heaven yet, you could say I'm being justified in A.R.'s tense in Greek, and that makes perfect sense. But the Protestant will just say it always means, therefore, having been justified. It already occurred. But that's actually not what the A.R.'s tense means. And for some saying, oh, well, you're being eisegetical, let me use an example. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed is a word which means Holy in the Aorist tense, all right, in the Greek. 
Even in English, we when we say hallowed, it's in the past tense. But we know it doesn't mean that. We're not saying God was hallowed. He's not hallowed anymore. Ironically, in English, when we say the Lord's Prayer, we're meaning it in the same context that our Greek would use, the aorist tense in so many examples like this one. The context demands when we're talking about God, if he's hallowed, he's continuing to be, he's continually hallowed. It's not a, we don't mean it strictly past tense, even though the word in English is past tense. We know better than that. So if we know better than that, the Greeks know aorist tense better than we do. We just had examples in Romans 4. And in Romans 3, where we're talking about justification in the continuous tense, that they would have every reason to believe that they were being justified, that the aor the aorus tense was usable because it was pertaining to something occurring that have not yet attained to its final completion. Okay. So I get into more detail on that in my first article justification for those who are interested, biblical justification. But that aside, the saints translate this way. Saint Jerome, when he translates the Vulgate, translates the Oris Greek word for justified as being justified. The King James, which is written by Protestants, translated by Protestants, does the same thing. So this is not some sort of orthodox eisegesis. It's actually the most compelling translation of the Greek into English. All right. So now, like I said, Romans talks about uh, Romans 5, Christ versus Adam. So <clears throat> let's kind of sum this up looking at verses 12 and 17. St. Paul says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin, by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, right? That's how sin entered the world. Much more those who receive bonds of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one, Jesus Christ. So as I said beforehand, St. Paul's whole reason talking about original sin isn't really to talk about original sin. It's just the implications of what he's talking about. He's explaining why there's death because sin's in the world. And that's because of Adam. We've inherited sinful proclivities from Adam. And what's the opposite of that? But there's life through Christ. We've, in, we've attained through Christ vivifying proclivities, Christ-likeness. We're made eternal because we are actually becoming the antithesis of sinful. Keywords becoming. You're still very sinful right now, and so am I. So that's beside the point. But the reason I'm bringing that up is because it St. Paul's whole point in drawing this dichotomy is talking about living by faith. We're abiding in Christ. It's this continuous reality. This, this whole aside makes no sense with the whole stream of the argument if this is not what he's getting at. So I hope now when you read Romans, you start seeing, oh, this argument is progressing. And it actually connects. There's a reason to it. He's not jumping topic to topic. Now, as I said, Romans 5 to 7, death reigns through, uh, death reigns through living like Adam, and life comes from living by faith. All right? So that's a typo there. Sorry for those looking at the screen. Life reigns through living by uh, faith. According to God's promise, death came by living like Adam. Now, this is further fleshed out in Romans 7. St. Paul says, I am carnal sold under sin, but what's this supposed to? I delight in the law of God according to the inward man who will deliver me from this body of death. Right? So there's two ways. We could die by living according to the flesh, according to the old man, or we could live by living according to the new man, Christ in us. Living by the righteousness of God, not of her own righteousness, the old man, but his righteousness. So St. Paul is trying to sell you a lifestyle, the life of Christ versus the life of Adam. Now, I agree, if only St. Paul were clear on that dichotomy, it would have prevented a lot of future confusion. But even St. Peter says there are those who misappropriate St. Paul. But if you understand the book of Romans as a continuous argument making the same point and he's summed up in the in the fashion in the beginning of Romans 1 and then builds from there, this is the most sensible way of understanding Romans 5 to 7. Now, he gives a summation that there's therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ, right? We talked about that in Romans 8, 1. We live according to the law of the Spirit. Now, Romans 8, 2 to 4 says, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. 
right? So, right, it wasn't me making stuff up at Romans 7. He's actually saying, living by Christ now sets me free from the sinful proclivities that became death, right? What we talked about, original sin, Romans 5. For what the law could not do, the Jewish law or our own conscience, and that it was weak through the flesh, right? According to our own righteousness, we could do nothing. We cannot save ourselves. There's no unrighteous no. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, right? So God took flesh, not flesh of literal sin because we're fallen, but he voluntarily assumed elements of the fall, the likeness of sinful flesh. So by being right, righteous, he can undo the fact that we have to die according to our sin. He undid sin. All right? So that's the whole point that St. Paul's making here. Why? So the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, right? Because Jesus did it, right? He sent his own son like the sinful flesh. He fulfills the law. Why? So those of us in Christ will have the righteous requirement of the law fulfilled how? It will be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We have to do something. We have to cooperate with the grace of God. We walk according to the spirit. That's what people, Calvinists say, that synergy is somehow you're earning your salvation. It's like, no, it's the exact opposite. We're walking according to the spirit. We're actually living the life of God, right? When you have energy essence distinction, you realize what Orthodox is saying. When you synergize, when you cooperate, cooperate, co-energize, same same words. When you co-energize with God, you're merely living with God. You're letting God run your life. That's what it means. You're living the life of God. That is theosis. That is eternity. That is salvation. That's why cooperation with the grace of God is how we're saved. Synergy is the only necessary way someone could be saved. Otherwise, God would just be arbitrarily damning people and saving people, and why not save everyone? That's why universalism is ultimately a mono, uh, a monergist heresy, right? That God can just flip the switch and turn everyone into saved. That's not how it works. You have to cooperate with the grace of God. That is salvation. It needs your will. That's why our orthodox anthropology, which is somewhat beyond what we have here, but orthodox anthropology is that by nature, we want to cooperate with the grace of God, but the fall, we don't want to cooperate anymore. Or we don't reflexively cooperate, and then that becomes death in us. All right. Now, speaking of death in us, Romans 8, 7 to 8, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can be. So then those who are in flesh cannot please God. Okay. So those without the spirit of God, will always be living according to concupiscence. If you talk in Latin or nomic will, if you talk in the Orthodox paradigm, and they cannot please God. They're the people of Romans 1 and 2, and the concupiscence talked about Romans 5 and 7. So, right, the unsaved in Romans 1 and 2 are the people that, are, whether they just don't care, they're the degenerates in Romans 1, or they're the uh, nominal law abiders in Romans 2, they are not pleasing God because they're living carnally. Now, in Romans 5, 7, we have some indication, well, there's struggle for Christians. And that's why we need ascetic disciplines. What we're doing is we are learning by living by faith to live as Christ continually and increasingly. All right? And that puts to death the old body. Who will save us from this body of death? Thanks be to Christ. Right? Christ is doing something in us. He is saving us. Now, I pressed the wrong button here. Now, Romans 8 continues that a new life is possible in Christ. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, right? We have these bodies of death, like concupiscence, even the Theotokos had that. Um, Damascene actually talks about, no, that's Germanus. St. Germanus actually talks about how that she could, she will have relief and be able to say farewell to the passions and and the uh, distractions of the body, right? Because the body's dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness, the righteousness of God. If you live according to the flesh, you will die, right? But if by this, and not because God arbitrarily will kill you, because it's the life of death. It's the proclivities of Adam that led to his death and dissolution. You live according to Adam and live in Adam, you will die. But if you live in Christ, the new Adam, who came like the sinful flesh, but destroyed death by death. 
you will live. If you live according to flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, Romans 8.13 is a singular verse that destroys Protestant soteriology. Because it says it in plain English, and it's also in the Greek, obviously, right there, that if you do something, you will live. If you live according to spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. It's something you have to do, but you have to cooperate with the grace of God. So it's not according to our own righteousness. It's according to his righteousness. That is the paradigm of Romans, which you see here. It's the orthodox soteriological paradigm. Now, let's talk about answering objections. Ironically, this sort of like Protestant sounding objections. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It says Romans 6.1. And St. Paul answers, no, we died unto sin. We're baptized and we partook in Christ's death and we've left the waters and partook in his resurrection. We can't live like that anymore. Now, if you get into the fathers, their whole point is the baptism does nothing unless you actually cooperate with that grace. You actually live according to faith. So really, faith is what makes the sacrament efficacious. And for the saints like St. Saint Peter Mogila will say, well, how about Babies, they don't have faith. Well, the faith of the sponsors makes it efficacious. Faith makes sacraments efficacious. We even see this when Je Jesus uh, heals the person on the mat, the paralytic. It says that Jesus looked upon the faith of the friends and healed him. And while well, he said, he looked upon the faith of the friends and he said, your sins are forgiven, actually is what he said first. And then they said, how can you forgive the sins? He said, what's easier to forgive sins or to say you could walk, right? So anyway, that's what happens. So faith is always what makes a sacrament or a miracle efficacious. You need faith. You need to cooperate with the grace of God. St. Paul is selling the lifestyle of Christ. Live the life of Christ. Live according to spirit and you will live. That is the gospel. It's not believe in this idea and it does something magical. No. Live according to the life of Christ and you will receive the life of Christ, his actual grace, his energies. Now he says, so we sin, grace may abound. No, we died in sin and we live according to God. Now the same objections repeated again. Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? And St. Paul says, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether it's of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, right? You've repented, you've been baptized. You have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. So like St. Paul says elsewhere, without holiness, none will see the Lord. Well, that's really not, it's sort of out of context, like in that passage, the point of him saying it there in Hebrews isn't necessarily to prove that point. Uh, but we see here, the idea is not wrong because when you become slaves of God, your fruit of holiness leads to the end, everlasting life, right? We're not talking about forensic justification. That's sadly a false doctrine, and I say sadly, because it's a doctrine I was duped by, and it's a doctrine so many other Protestants are duped by, but it's clearly not what's in the book of Romans. Now, Romans 7 also talks about objections a little bit. It says, how about the law? And pretty much St. Paul gives a kind of funny answer. He says, well, there's been a death in the family, right? You know, a widow is not, you know, still married to the dead husband. She could remarry. Now, technically, that's less than ideal in orthodoxy. And if you guys have questions, you can start asking them. You know, it's less than ideal in orthodoxy. We prefer that people be married once and they'll only do a maximum of three marriages canonically. But that's beside the point. That's not what St. Paul's point is here. The, lo the law is not in effect because Christ died. He fulfilled the law. He died. Now there's something new. It's the life of Christ. It's the teachings of the church, right? Now, he then also says, well, how about the law? Well, how about Romans 7, 7? I would have known sin except through the law. So the law gives us awareness of sin. So it also serves that purpose. So St. Paul is trying to redeem the law, showing its lawful purposes. Now, we talked about Romans 9, 11. How about promises to the Jews? And let me just say this. The way God chooses people to be saved is not how it looks. It doesn't go by the older son he, right, he has, he's the heir of the promises. He ought to be the heir to salvation because his father was the heir of the promises of God. And the answer is no, that's not how it works. And the same way the Jews, God's chosen people, they're not chosen in the way you'll think to be chosen like Esau, not the firstborn son. Sometimes God goes to the secondborn, the Gentiles. 
So the way God chooses is not how it looks. And the same goes for us. God knows the end of the beginning. He doesn't see any righteousness in us that he chooses us. Rather, he saves us so that we may become righteous. All right? And St. Augustine teaches this ad nauseum against the Pelagians. Now, let's make some conclusions which kind of sum up what we were talking about. Natural Mosaic law condemns everyone. People are condemned because they live in Adam. They live according to Adam, to the old man. People are saved if they live in Christ, right? It's something they actually do. They live according to Christ. We walk by faith, not by sight. Christ undid the work of Adam generally, right? He became the likeness of sinful flesh. And he can undo the work of Adam in you if you personally do so through faith, right? So Christ works salvation, but it only becomes operative in you Right, energizing, operative, same word, if you cooperate, that you co-energize with God. You actually partake in the life of God. You actually partake in his righteousness. Faith is a continuous reality that manifests itself in works. And works are not the basis of life in Christ, but they are part of a life in Christ. This is where people, you can't pit these things against each other. We had an Orthodox priest here, Father Pisces. And he actually kind of flippantly said in the last show, he's like, I don't understand how people try to put faith and works against each other. They're the same thing. And when you read the fathers, the fathers talk about faith and works like they're the same thing. They apply them identically. And it's because works are not the basis of a life in Christ. They do not earn a salvation, but they are part of the life in Christ. They're part of faith. So they're not against each other. They complement each other. All right. Now, let me end with this. And I believe this is our last slide, and then we'll do uh, second last slide. We'll do questions and comments. St. Paul writes, for Christ, whoopsie, we're going the wrong way. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness, which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. Right? So you got to do everything in the law if you want to be righteous by the law. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. How's it different? Do not say in your heart will ascend it to heaven. That is, to bring Christ down from above, right? You're not you're not bringing him down. Or who will ascend to the abyss, that is, bring Christ up from the dead, right? You're not doing something to force Christ to save you. You're not forcing him to your life. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the Lord, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek for the Lord, the same Lord over all, is rich to all who call upon him. So, you, my audience, I extend to you the invitation to repent and trust in Christ. It's not a rocket launch. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Matthew 11:30. Is it a cross? Yes, you will bear your cross. And you're going to want to bear the cross, the suffering Christ, more and more and more. You're going to want to pursue the ascetic life. But the life of sin is actually more difficult. It can never satisfy you. But it's more blessed to give and receive, as Jesus Christ said. And those who give themselves and live the life of God will understand the peace of God. They'll uh, be able to deal with difficulties and burdens in a way which other people can deal with. Doesn't mean it will feel good. That cross is heavy. But it's easy because you don't have to do it alone. Christ is carrying the cross with you. All you have to do is be along for the ride. So it starts with a simple confession in the mouth. And you're saved. And if you die then, you're saved. But the heart that truly confesses Christ will live according to the Spirit and will reap the fruits of the Spirit, and the joys of the Spirit, and also the struggles of the Spirit. Christ promises temptations and trials, and well, not temptations, but trials and difficulties and persecutions. These things will come too, because all these things are teaching us to be like Christ. And so then we don't hunger things in this world, the things don't last, the water which will thirst again. When we start having what's eternal, and have joy in what's eternal, then no one could take that joy away. If your joy is in something worldly, then when that worldly thing's gone, you will experience loss. But if your joy is in your heart, the faith that was preached by St. Paul, someone could take everything away from your life. 
And they can hurt you, and they can hurt you worse. But they can't take that which is in you. And that's a joy that can't be taken away. That's why St. Paul learned to be content in all circumstances. That is the easy burden, right? Because you could lose everything, and you still have the strength to have that because no one could take it away. All right? So that is the book of Romans today. And I hope you guys will be able to read the book of Romans and enjoy it in a way that you maybe didn't enjoy it before. So if you guys have questions, please ask. Otherwise, I'm just going to look here. We already talked about the egg and bacon sandwich. There you go. Oh, we got this. Jacob, I love these. I hated Calvin's and improved. Oh, well, all right. I guess we, uh, I guess this whole show was a waste. Sorry about that. You could watch the Romans 9 uh, episode and we could get into that in more. <laughs> you could get to that in more detail. Now, Nate says, glory to God. Will this be saved as a video after? And yeah, I mean, it should be in the channel unless like my channel gets taken down. It will be up in a few hours automatically. So by all means, check back. And uh, the link you are here is the same link. So if you copy and paste, you can watch it over and over. All right, let's see. What's this? The other Paul. There is definitely such a thing as over-contextualization, wherein the author's words are totally defined by an alleged context, choking out the author's own intent. Absolutely. How many people will read St. Paul in 1 Timothy 2 and he's saying women can't teach in church and they'll be saved through childbearing? Like, can't possibly mean that, right? If you understood he's writing within a certain content, but, and it's like you're explaining away his words. <laughs> He gives, he gives a very clear rationale, and he sources it in creation. He said it wasn't Adam that was the seeds, but Eve, right? So we could overly contextualize, and you will find generally people with that try to contextualize things are generally actually saying false history. Another one. They'll say, well, in Corinth there was a problem and uh, with prostitutes not you know around town, and so they made women wear head coverings so they wouldn't look like prostitutes. Find a single contemporary source that teaches it. It's like made up meme history. You'll see like people doctorate saying it, but it doesn't exist. There's not a single source in history that talks about this. So people even make up context. So that's why in the beginning, I want to give some sort of light context. You sort of get some sort of feeling for the biblical St. Paul. But I think the words of Romans really explain itself. If you actually follow the verb tenses and the actual argumentation as it unfolds, it's pretty clear that the Book of Romans isn't making the Protestant or typical 20, 21st century Roman Catholic or, or Orthodox case. Like even Thomas Aquinas used the term faith alone when you read his commentary in Romans 4. So it's, it's, it's like this whole paradigm for understanding Roman has been uh, unpacked since Luther, and it's just totally incorrect. It doesn't do justice to what St. Paul is actually talking about. But I don't think Luther was the first one at least to – mishandle it in a, in such a fashion because Romans 6 and Romans 3 where St. Paul rebukes people are saying why not since so grace may abound he says that condemnation is deserved so certain people said well I don't have to follow the law and the law of nature makes me not righteous I could pretty much do whatever I want so that's always been a sort of temptation uh, to misunderstand Christianity and St. Paul I think pretty definitively says that's not the case in this uh, this epistle now, I like this cult of modernism over such under-contextualization has no meaning without the consensus, the fathers, the goalpost. And I agree. That's why I like to do something in the fathers. But if this was a hard video and PowerPoint to put together, the fathers would be even tougher because there's so much more. Also, a video like this is a good gateway for Protestants that are looking into this. Right, if I just go quote fathers, quote fathers, quote fathers, they're just going to say, well, Orthodox, all they care about is fathers reading history books. They don't care about the Bible anymore. Well, you got a whole bunch of Bible here. You know, what are you going to do with it? Right. So hopefully that will that will help. Now, someone said, no bay, egg and bacon today. It's a fast day. Well, that's true, unless you're cradle. Someone asked, how does get recommended me? I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. If we have any any other real question, I'm a prot. Good for you. At least you're a Christian. But I like Craig's content. Good. If you're ortho, you'll probably like it even more. And uh, and then this is where I feel bad. Like I just kind of speak my mind. So I don't think like when I'm saying Protestants, I'm wrong. I'm like trying to own Protestants or 
own anyone for that matter. It's just me speaking my mind. It's why I, it's why I complain about 20th, 21st century Orthodox apologetics. It's like Roman Catholic apologetics. It mishandles this book. So we got to critique everyone that mishandles the book of Romans. Da da da. Now, Craig Sober and Jenna, man of history. Now, I try to be a man of history. I I don't own enough books where I could crush a foundation in my house. And history is sort of like a hobby, but it's important to learn to read history. And we have to understand what lens of history we're using. We have to understand what lens of history the people we're reading we're using. And a lot of these things start unfolding, but it takes time. It's like you don't you don't become like a marathon runner after training for one day. You got to just keep reading history books and keep reading the Bible. And it actually gets quicker and faster and you get more. I think I want to do an episode on how to go Super Saiyan as quick as possible, right? <laughs> I don't know what else to call this thing. There's certain books if you read where you'll jump power levels exponentially. So, for example, like Expedition Orthodox Faith. You know, put the five hours in or six hours, it's not that long, to read Exposition Orthodox Faith from St. John of Damascus, and you'll jump power levels. Um, read Emmanuel Hasidic as Jesus Fallen, and you'll jump power levels. That'll take much longer than six hours, though. You know, uh, Dr. Benjamin Heidgerken has a book coming out. You read that, you'll jump power levels, right? If you want to understand No McWill, and he actually gets into Thomas Aquinas, how he differs with St. Maximus. It's it's absolutely fascinating. There are certain books where you could jump power levels, and you'll get you'll be you'll be smarter than like most adults. But ultimately, if you really want to understand this stuff, you have to read the fathers, you have to read the lives of the saints, and the hagiographies. You have to have a prayer life. You have to fast if you really really want to get deep into it. And I'm just even starting, but it's amazing how deep you start getting by doing those things. And so that's what I that's what I recommend. Uh, about that. And so let's see. We got uh, an RT fan. Now, wasn't RT really great in their first season? You know, it started going downhill after that. But yeah, I think it had a real good first season. <laughs> I had to give myself credit. <laughs> now, let's see. We're continuing. Exploiting technicalities, the law ignores the spirit, which is precisely what Christ is against. I agree. Now we see this. I'm interested to see whether Craig sees works in Romans and other letters as good works in general or merely ceremonial works of law. I actually think it's about both. Why not both? Like the, the mean. The fathers say it's the law of nature and works the law. In Romans, um, St. Paul applies it to the Mosaic law, but he explicitly applies it to Abraham, which would be the law of nature. So there's that as well. Let's see. Now, even if Romans 3.20 talks about works in general, it is only talking about initial justification. Now, initial justification is actually a word from the Roman Catholic Catechism. It's not, like, wrong. I might have to do an episode on the Roman Catholic Catechism at one point. It's somewhat useful to slice and dice, but it's not a patristic term, right? Like, but it's not wrong, right? Like, there's a time when you're first justified, and then it just keeps going after that. So the works continue, you know, because you keep – being alive after you're first justified, but you could be justified before you have time to do good works. How do I know? I just quoted St. Bede. So it's something the saints also teach. Let's see. Da, da, da. People arguing with each other. And yes, Timothy says there's a point where his faith was imperfect till he proved it by obedience. And that's true. Cause we see that James too. Now, we have to understand a perfect, not as deficient, right? So when we read the saints, we'll see how they talk about the Theotoko. She was born perfect. And then the saint will say, and then at the age of three, she was brought to the temple and she was made more perfect. And then she was made utterly perfect by the Annunciation when the incarnation occurred. So what we see is how the Saints understand perfection. It's something that also increased, just like justification, right? There's no forensic perfection. There was like, you know, there's a point where you become perfect and your accountant is perfect. You know, perfection is something that increases. And that's how the saints treat perfection. 
And it's interesting because Abraham would have been gone to heaven, but his faith is improved and his salvation is improved by being obedient and doing works according to his faith. So yes, his faith was imperfect. That's what James uh, 2.23, am I getting wrong? Or is it 2.21? You get the point. We quoted it here. So you can just click rewind. Let's see. I like that, you know, benching 125 pounds of money, giving 350 pounds of Bible preaching. Um, all, all these things have to be all good works like uh, St. Seraphimus Roth talks about is you want to acquire the Holy Spirit. And he says, do the thing that works best. So if you give alms and you draw really close to God giving alms, then give more alms. So we're all looking for opportunities, and that's why you work with a spiritual father. It is supposed to be your, your personal trainer to figure out ways to cooperate with the grace of God increasingly. Now, someone says about the aorist tense, we talked about that. Uh, it, it has to do with something that has occurred with an indeterminate um, point of completion, right? That's actually what the aorist tense is, and so context demands whether it actually already completed or whether it's yet to be completed. Now, we have Orthodox and Papists going back and forth. Good for them, but it doesn't mean that they aren't nice, uh, nice Roman Catholics. Now, let's see. We have Go Yankees. Now, I'll just say, sadly, baseball's been ruined for me in a couple of ways. One, the all the science that's gotten into like pitching deliveries and stuff has made it where everyone pitches the same, everyone hits the same, makes it boring. The other thing is I don't want – when I watch a sport, I'm not there to watch politics. I'm not there to watch a civil rights rally or a pride rally or a breast cancer awareness or Father's Day. I don't even like that stuff. I want to see guys hit baseball. So, yeah, that's, well, that's what I want to watch. They've – They've ruined sports. Someone asks, so is fasting necessary for salvation? Didn't Christ say that this prayer won't be answered except by prayer, uh, that uh, miracles won't work except by prayer and fasting? So yes, all good works are necessary for salvation. Am I going to slice and dice and say, well, did the did the thief on the cross fast right before he was saved and stuff like that? And it's kind of irrelevant. The point is we do all sorts of works of Christ. We live as Christ did. He fasted. To be saved. So the faith will always have these works. Now, someone says true faith will produce works, which is true. It just doesn't mean that those works have no salvific quality whatsoever, which we reviewed uh, during the episode. All right, we see this. Um, how would you argue for an incomplete slash in continuous reading of the present tense deaco verbs as opposed to a simple present state of being that doesn't necessarily entail incomplete? Maybe I'm stupid or it's late. Not getting this question. <laughs> Let me read again. How would you argue for an incomplete slash continuous reading of the present tense uh, diaco verbs as opposed to a simple present state of being? I'll have to get my wife here. She's more of the grammar expert. I'm not understanding this. Please forgive me. Maybe if I my brains come to me, I will write a comment about that. You made this in just our response to my over context comment. The example of egalitarian shoehorning alleged context of Paul spot on, right? Thank you so much for bringing that up. And oh, what's the book I'm holding up? All right, let me put it real close to the screen. Ancient Christian commentaries in scripture, New Testament, six Romans. It's uh, Thomas the Odin's now dead. May uh, God rest his soul. He said, I will have no new. Theology, which means to become Orthodox, but at least he went from Marxist to conservative Presbyterian. And uh, you'll see there, there are the books. I got most of them for free. I think I had to buy a couple of them. But it's these commentaries from the Church Fathers, which are awesome to have. They're not complete. Sometimes it get, but a lot of stuff is stuff that's not translated. It's open source, so it's a uh, a way to get a lot more Ambrosiaster, a lot more even guys like Origin, guys that are hard to get. It's not perfect, but it's certainly better than nothing. I'm very happy to have them. I also use Aquinas Study Bible. Go to google.com. You go to Aquinas Study Bible. You also go to google.com, and you put New Advent, and then you put in Church Fathers, and you put in quotation marks the Bible verse, 
and you'll find instantly a ton of verses that the fathers quote. But the best way, of course, is to read fathers cover to cover. But if you're just trying to quickly find what they say about this verse while you're doing a Bible, you essentially have made your own study Bible by doing that. So, guys, here last chance for questions. Now I'm going to say, guys, if this has blessed you, here's an opportunity to live by faith, right? Which is go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. You don't give me money. There is money wiring instructions. Donate to the churches in Cambodia, which are expanding, preaching the gospel. They need they need donors that are committed that will continuously donate a dollar a month, five bucks a month, whatever. Continuously donate. So that way they could budget and slowly grow in Cambodia. Ideally, we want to eventually make ortho, Orthodox clergymen out of several Cambodians, and that will be how the church really grows. Believe it or not, that's why you need monasteries. Like Thailand has a small monastery, but Cambodia doesn't have any. So please help support orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. And if there's money, money uh, laundering, no, money wiring instructions, or you could also go to the PayPal. I'll send it for you. Every cent is sent to Cambodia. All right. So don't worry about any PayPal fees. Whatever you donate will be sent to Father Pisces and Father Roman in Cambodia for the preaching the gospel in Cambodia and the evangelizing of the Khmer people. But that's not just it. Uh, give money to Jordanville, Holy Trinity Monastery. Uh, St. Denisius, the Areopagite Monastery, local monastery that needs your support, someone in your town. If this is blessed to you, bless someone else and God will bless you because by you doing this good work, you are cooperating in the grace of God, whatever good work that may be. It's not just giving money to the show. You are partaking the life of God. Christ gave himself totally, right? He emptied himself, taking the form of what appeared to be sinful flesh and died, right? Died for you. And so we die slightly to ourselves when we deny ourselves something. We could have Netflixed with the money or whatever people do with it. Bought another book. Bought Dr. Benjamin Heidgerken's book, uh, Salvation Through Temptation, or Emmanuel has it there, whatever cool books, right? But instead, no, I did this good work with it. And God will bless you. Maybe, probably not financially, though. I, it is true. You've noticed, like, people that tithe tend not to be, like, really broke. Like, they tend, God tends to take care of them. But there's nothing written in stone that that's actually going to happen. So the point is you do the right thing and you trust in the grace of God. This is just one such opportunity. My heart is with the Kamai people because my wife's Kamai. And I'm so grateful that there's Orthodox churches in our country. And we hope and pray that it grows. But let's say you have no money. I will selfishly ask you, please pray for me for 10 seconds in your evening prayers tonight and pray for the churches of Cambodia. For another 10 seconds. If you even if all people watching this did just that, it will make a world of difference. So I covet your prayers. Please do that. If you can't support financially, that may even be more important. Sometimes the widow's might is worth more than the, the thousands of dollars some people give. All right. Now, all right. Someone's giving me one more chance trying to answer this question. Ha ha. I'm referring to your argument, the verbs for being justified. Being in the press sense, which you argue entails an ongoing justification, not instant. I still, <laughs> I still don't get it. Please pray for me that God will help me understand that. Well, this has gone long enough. This has been fun, and you got questions? Feel free to ask them, and uh, I hopefully you'll be able to go in the com box. I'll end the show as I end all my shows by saying, "Fight to death for the truth." The Lord God will fight for you. God bless you all. Have a good night.